generally that sort of aha moment or that true like idea or insight that is original will not come as you're sitting on the computer reading an article or typing out an outline. When you're kind of letting the mind quiet down and not doing so much active researching and thinking, that's when all of that kind of starts to process somewhere behind that really um, powerful thinking mind that we have and kind of just allows it, the creative um, aspect of the brain to come out. We're calling this show, Good Work Begins With Good Health. And uh, for this week, uh, we've, I've been thinking a lot about, our guest is a strategist, and uh, you know, we, we were talking about how uh, in strategy, uh, you're really setting out to usually illuminate uh, some insight about uh, humans and how they behave. Uh, but what happens when you set out to pursue that kind of insight and you find that you've got blockers that are related to not being able to think straight or being too tired or just feeling out of your, you know, your body and your, your, the, the space where you're comfortable doing your work. Well, our guest today is someone who has answered that question, at least as best as you can, or is on the road to answering that question um, by looking further upstream and thinking about how uh, the um, ability to produce good work uh, in her workspace or really in any workspace is related to uh, the well-being of the mind and the body that does it. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, Alexa Borky, who is a senior strategist at Eisenberg. Uh, so welcome, Alexa. Thanks so much for having me, Matt. Super excited to have this conversation with you today. All right. Well, why don't we start right at the top and you know, tell me a little bit just to set the table for the episode about your point of view on you know how a commitment uh, to your career as a strategist is related to your career as uh, a, a person who's a yoga instructor now uh, and uh, is dedicated to the health of your body and your mind. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no time more relevant than 2020, right, to have this conversation. Um, it's really illuminated even more so for me this year, the importance of really focusing on that mind and body health. Um, now that we've kind of adapted to this new world of doing everything from home, right, from working to um, exercising and everything in between. So I think, you know, for sure, specifically, you know, for any career, it's so important to have that focus on um, your own personal health really first, right, so that you can bring your full self um, and your full healthy self, body and mind to the computer every day. Um, so for me, it's really, you know, it's been a journey and I think it's always um, a great reminder to like kind of remind myself to practice what I preach as well. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to have that conversation around, you know, how I've started to incorporate more um, mindfulness as well as my yoga practice um, into my my career and also into my days um, in this very different kind of working from home landscape. Yeah, one of the things that was really interesting to me as we started to talk about doing this show was that insight that you offered up about uh, about how, as a strategist, you're often thinking about the future or the past, and that's a little bit different, you know, in your role as a as a yoga instructor and someone focused on on health and well being. Uh, where did, was that something that came up just like live as we were talking together, or is it something that you've uh, reflected on over time? Yeah, I think um, sort of that initial conversation that we had really kind of made that insight bubble up in my mind. Um, I've been doing personally a lot of reading and uh, kind of self-study around mindfulness and presence um, and really trying to kind of train myself to stay more in the present moment and um, thinking about how that ties to a career specifically in um, any type of, I think, marketing science, be it, you know, insights or strategy, um, we're constantly kind of fluctuating between, you know, looking back at um, data and, and then looking forward to how do we make better decisions and how do we improve using that data. And very uh, seldom do we kind of take that pause in the present moment, right? So it's kind of interesting when you think about um, presence and mindfulness and and a career um, in, you know, advertising in a lot of different capacities where I think we're always sort of making those fluctuations between um, what can we learn from what we just did and then quickly pivot to the next and looking ahead to what's to come. 
Um, and, and oftentimes when we don't take those pauses to kind of celebrate and uh, pause and think about what's going on in the present moment. Um, so I've kind of been trying to incorporate more ways into my work day, be it like before I actually sit down at my laptop or um, as I kind of transition into the evenings and also throughout the day, kind of taking those, you know, very mindful moments to um, come back to the present moment. Yeah, I don't know if it's being on this. Is This is a new set for those that have seen the show before, you know. Uh, and by the way, it's a one night only set. We're going to go to another new set after the, after Alexa's episode, so uh, don't get used to it. But uh, I don't know if it's being uh, on a new set. But I was starting to get, I don't know if I was getting nervous, but I, I, I was starting to get a little hot, you know. And it's not the temperature in here, but I was like, what is going on? And the wonderful thing about having this episode with you and, and just really being focused on mind and body and well-being is I was like, wait a sec, am I breathing? Oh, no, I'm not breathing at all, you know? And I just, while you were speaking, I just reminded myself to take a deep breath, which can be so weird, right, in the workplace, I, I, which I think is really strange, you know, like at least for me, starting to experiment with applying um, some lessons that I'm learning in life about, uh, uh, you know, focus, being aware of my body and being aware of my breath in the workplace sometimes feels almost too intimate. Absolutely. And I think often, you know, throughout the workday, I catch myself even holding my breath entirely. You know, as we start to um, get in the moment of something's due quickly or this email just came in or I need to react to this person, um, you kind of can feel your body start to tense up and the breath is probably one of the first things that goes with it. And I'm totally a culprit as well of catching myself, um, you know, either not breathing fully or kind of breathing just enough to kind of get through, you know, even if you catch yourself, I think twice a day or once a day, um, just noticing how your body's feeling as a start and noticing what that breath is like. Um, and then kind of expanding that to, you know, multiple times a day and maybe even just having an hourly check in. Um, that's really, you know, so healthy, even just really, I think step one is just that realization aspect, even if you're not able to completely change everything right away, just like becoming more aware of, is there tension being held somewhere? And is it a direct, you know, relation to what's going on um, on Teams or Outlook or whatever's happening work wise that day? Um, and that's sort of what I was talking about as well with like starting to de develop more of a pre-work ritual before you sit down. I know, um, again, going back to this year, it's been so different without, I used to have an hour commute in the car each way to mm. and from Eisenberg, which actually, you know, while not ideal, gave me that time to sort of like prepare for the day, listen to a podcast, have a coffee, and then on the way home, you know, unwind, talk to family or friends, um, and just sort of have that separation between uh, work and and home. And of course, you know, now all of us um, have adapted over the past eight months or so to not necessarily having that. And I think a lot of us and myself included in certain kind of waves have defaulted to, you know, the first thing you do in the morning when you wake up is check your email, see what happened in, you know, the hours that you weren't online. Um, and then there's this tendency to want to kind of grab the cup of coffee and jump on the computer and kind of there goes the day and you zoom ahead um, and I'm, I'm very much guilty of that, as I know a lot of us are. Um, so it's really kind of making that intention to have some sort of morning ritual or pause before jumping fully into that. And then the same thing goes for the end of the day, really kind of like making that intention um, to end at a certain time, even if you might have to come back hours later, but really, you know, making the intention to step away and then just kind of easing into the evening um, and I've noticed, you know, I think it's it's a tendency to think, well, I really can't get offline. I need to finish this. Um, I must stay on. And and really just those times when I've actually forced myself to take that step away, um, even if I do have to come back later, it's with a whole totally different frame of mind and presence. Um, and it's kind of amazing what refresh thinking a lot of times can come after that taking just a, a five or 10 minutes or hour or whatever it might be at the end of the day, beginning of the day, middle of the day to take that step away. Even if you just take 10 minutes and even if you do it one day and you don't do it the next day, that's for me, a part of my uh, always evolving practice has been realizing that um, in much the same way that in 
in meditation, there is the process of a thought coming and you could beat yourself up about that and say like, uh, you know, I'm thinking too much. I can't get out of my head. And it's taken me a while to realize that um, that is the natural process of the mind is that something uh, thoughts occur and then I'm learning how to release those those thoughts and be, you know, in the moment. And and uh, and sometimes you'll be more successful than that. And other times you'll be and even successful is maybe not the right word. Right. Sometimes you'll do that with great consistency and sometimes you'll just be fraught with all kinds of thoughts. And I think that lesson applies to so many of the little choices that you just outlined, which is even if you just do it today, you, you go out and you start your day for 10 minutes. Maybe you'll do it three days from now. Maybe you'll start to find that that, you know, feels groovy and you'll do it, you know, every day and maybe you won't. Yeah, it's about testing and trying what feels good. And, and again, like to your point, not beating yourself up about it if you don't tomorrow, you know, revamp your entire schedule and start meditating for an hour before you work. It's about like making those really micro changes and, and being okay with it on the days that it might not um, work out. I think uh, you and I talked about this a little bit, Matt, as well. Like you're kind of surprised because you think I don't have the time. I don't. I absolutely can't fit any time for that into my schedule. Um, and for people with kids, I admire you even more because I know how much, you know, how precious time is outside of work. However, you had kind of shared with me, Matt, like once you started to, you know, kind of force yourself at some point to carve out that time, you realize you were still getting everything done that you needed to do in the end. And it's almost like this gift that like more time somehow develops for us or something. <laughs> I'm, bl I'm glad you brought us uh, around to that because it is that story is a very complimentary idea because I, I am actually taking a lot more time with uh, um, a kind of practice that's a mix of meditation and just and hiking, you know, a, a morning hike. And it, I actually am spending a bunch of time that I would have said to you several weeks ago, uh, I don't have, you know. And I can tell you, testify to the fact that I started these practices and whole secret parts of the day seem to have open, opened up, you know. I don't know for sure if it's that I am more efficient um, because I'm more centered and focused or if I choose to do things at a different rhythm or cadence, it's a mystery to me. But the great news is, and this is sort of why I say it's the compliment to you, like on the one hand, you and I would say, hey, if you can only take five minutes, take five minutes. And on the other hand, I'm saying, guess what? If you take an hour, you might feel like you have two extra hours. Yeah, it's pretty amazing in that way. And I love the, uh, the fact that you're incorporating hiking into it. I think that kind of anything active, like walking, running, or hiking, um, I personally love as, you know, to kind of throw on headphones and then listen to a guided meditation while doing something like that. I think, you know, meditation sounds um, kind of scary to some people because they're like, well, I can't just sit cross-legged on a cushion on the ground for 20 minutes. I, I can't do that. And that's okay. I think um, for some people, it's good to keep moving during it. It's great to like take a walk with it or a hike or a run if you're a runner and like have that movement and, and, and kind of use that time um, in both ways. And for me, I really found um, that I've enjoyed evening walks with it. So it's all about finding what works for you. But again, not criticizing yourself and, and feeling like you have to, you know, just sit cross-legged on the ground for an hour or you have not meditated, right? So... Yeah, yeah it, it, it happened for me because I, I was take I was doing a, a, a basically an average of about a 10 minute sit and meditate in the morning. And then I would go out and do what at the beginning I was saying was this other thing of hiking. And then at some point I realized, wait a sec, they're so similar, you know, like I'm just moving and breathing, but it's still all about breathing and the same breathing that I was working on while I was sitting I'm actually work applying to my hiking and I realized it's the same practice. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, it's the same with, with a yoga practice as well. Um, really the heart of yoga is the breath. Um, and Western yoga has become all about, you know, mastering these really difficult um, Instagram worthy poses. Right. But at the same <laughs> time, you really have to come back to the, what is the core of it? And it is the breathing and finding that like mind body connection through the breath, um, which is always there for us and um, always there for us throughout the day as well. So really that beauty, I think one of the 
most awesome things about um, this year and working remotely is the opportunity for you to be able to drop down onto the ground um, or stand up and do whatever kind of crazy stretch feels good in your body. And there's probably no one there to see you except for your own family. Um, We might not have done that when we were in the office. So there is really this nice aspect of um, being at home and having that comfort to even if it is five, 10 minutes, 20, whatever it might be, um, just kind of taking that time to stretch and move in a way that feels great. Um, And whether that's before, after work or during, you know, all all is great. I think that the, you know, the downside of it is that we are working longer hours, you know, statistically, um, research has shown that this year, people are working, I think, on average, like 40 minutes longer than than they were before. Um, And I'm definitely guilty of that as well. But, you know, that uh, tends to cause like the body to kind of hunch forward when we're on our laptops. And like, really, it's kind of taking those moments to say, okay, we're working longer, let's also Um, not let that impact the body and how do we sort of reverse that so we have a couple of stretches at the end of of this to uh, incorporate into that (laughs) I'm so excited I hey why don't we talk about uh, tell us the story of how you became uh, I don't even know if I've set this up entirely clearly so I'll do it now in case I didn't but you're teaching a regular uh, yoga class for remotely for uh, people from Eisenberg and so I'm wondering uh Tell you can you tell us the story of how that happened for you, kind of what your you know your background is that brought you to where you are now? Absolutely. Uh, so I've been practicing yoga for probably on and off ten years or so, and sort of have had periods where I've been really consistent with my practice, and then others where I have not, depending on you know where I've lived and and other life events. Um, and I actually moved to California about three years ago from the East Coast, and one of the first. Uh, places I went when I moved was a yoga studio that was located actually in my apartment building in the bottom floor. So I was super lucky. Um, and then really just kind of continued to develop a more consistent practice over the course of those about two, two and a half years. Essentially, I got really lucky because my 200 hours began in January, ended in March, and ironically, um, ended the day before pretty much everyone in the U.S. went into full Uh, stay at home mode. So it was that Sunday, I think it was March 16th, um, that just so happened to be the end of the program anyway. And so thankfully, we were able to finish. And it was really, um, it was really hard to make that transition after the program was over, because I went from working, you know, at the office five days a week to being in the studio every Saturday and Sunday all day, um, to then being home every single day, without anywhere to go really and it was just a really stark transition um so I started to develop more of like a home practice um and started to teach for family and friends just via zoom and then started to transition that um to teaching at a corporate level so I introduced the idea to HR and um shout out to Eisenberg for being super receptive and um celebratory of the idea And so ever since, I think it's been about May, end of May, um, I've been teaching weekly Tuesday classes offered for anybody at the company on Zoom. Um, And we've actually now gotten to a point where we alternate Tuesday mornings to Tuesday evenings because, of course, there's people um, who are either more morning person, more evening, or um, depending on work schedule and kids and all of that good stuff. And it's kind of interesting because this has been my very first, you know, teaching experience has been virtual. So it'll be really cool when eventually I get to transition that back into being more physically, physically there with with folks. And uh, how is the feedback from the people, Ben? Like, do you get a lot of feedback about the classes? You know, sometimes, sometimes not. But there's definitely a feeling after an awesome class. And, you know, not not every class is a thousand percent. But you know which ones really like hit it spot on. And uh, there's like a a feeling that I can come away with from that. And usually that's um, because I'm super prepared um, and have practiced myself quite a bit leading up to that class. So I'm always taking inspiration from other classes that I'm taking or just even practicing on my own and trying to come up with cool new sequences and combinations of poses and kind of different intents for different classes. So once um, when there's weeks that I'm able to do that preparation and, and be really consistent with my own practice, um, that's when I feel like I'm able to show up the, the best to teaching. And 
and also to bring the most kind of creativity into the classes. Um, that's one part. And then the other part is, you know, really kind of taking that time before class to, to find my own sense of grounding and groundedness. Um, cause sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. There'll be a 6 p.m. class and I might be on a call until 5.30 and then quickly pivot to rolling out the mat and setting up. And I kind of have to take that second too to just kind of come back to my body and my breath so that I can show up in a... Uh, my goal is always just to exude a sense of calm and grounding for everyone else. Um, because certainly if the teacher doesn't feel that way, it's not going to, you know, extend to the class <laughs> either. So that's really my number one goal because... I know everyone's showing up to kind of find that sense of, of peace and calm and um, sense of self for that hour. So it's important that I bring that as well. So let's talk about the other things that you bring to the practice. You've done a lot of alluding uh, in great ways over the course of this discussion to reading that you're doing um, and your own personal journey. Besides your training, um, what are the other influences that you're bringing to some of the teaching work that you're doing now with the Eisenberg community? Yeah, so first, I think the reading is a really big one for me. Um, and one of the kind of tenets of, of yoga from more of a philosophical standpoint is this idea of self-study and consistent lifelong self-study and learning. So for me, I consider myself a lifetime learner. I'm constantly curious, trying to, uh, you know, better myself and find more information. And I'm also an avid reader. So a couple of um, the main books that I've read, actually, one of the first ones that I read after my training was um, called The Yamas and the Niyamas, which is basically um, an, the ethical practice of yoga. And very similar, I kind of compare it sometimes to the Ten Commandments, um, because it is actually a set of 10 sort of um, p pillars to live by. Um, and interestingly, it's divided into five sort of um things to restrain from or avoid, and then five pillars to to practice. Uh, there's one called Ask and It Is Given. I actually have them here next to me. Ask and It Is Given is really awesome, um, really all about the idea that, you know, the universe is, is here um, providing this stream of wellness to all of us, and really all we have to do is be receptive to it. And in that book really talks about being three steps of, you know, asking for what you want, and that could be, you know, inviting in, um, a new home into your life or um, a new relationship or whatever it might be that you're sort of seeking. And then um, step two being answer, which comes from the universe, which will react immediately and provide that answer and that path toward what you're looking for. And then the third step being back on us, which is really, really the difficult one. And this is where we all get stuck because we all know how to kind of ask for things. The universe does its job of answering. And then the third part is really allowing or accepting um, whatever that answer is to come in. And that's the part where we all have so much resistance. Your observations on um, Ask and It Is Given reminded me that there is a, uh, that it's a real familiar challenge in the workplace. You know, uh, the, the most of us have things that we're really um, hopefully happy about, about our jobs. And then there are things that we um, are really struggle with. And uh, I often am, as a mentor in the workplace, working with people to figure out, can you, you know, do the process that you just uh, talked about from uh, um, Ask and It Is Given of identifying uh, what are the things that you would like to do here and what are the things that you would like to change and what do you want to keep and, you know, ask, ask the workplace and the, you know, and the universe by corollary for that. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's kind of amazing, you know, what's possible and, and with directly related to this conversation, I think, um, none of us like that feeling, all those feelings that come in every job of occasional imposter syndrome or, you know, the nervousness of waiting to do a show, uh, you know, uh, all of those things, um, can be to some degree, uh, mitigated by, inviting in the type of uh, physical uh, and uh, breath work that we're talking about here as a part of your daily routine and work, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I love that you, you brought me down to earth a little bit and brought it back to the workplace, but I think there's so many applications there as well. And, and sometimes um, all it is is actually asking. Like I, I proposed the idea of teaching yoga and uh, 
there we, here we are. Mm-hmm. And so how amazing. And, and, you know, sometimes it does take that ask, right. Or that proposition of a new idea or, Hey, let's do this differently. Or, Hey, can we approach this differently this time around? Um, because a lot of times if you don't, you know, no one else is going to come, come and do it for you. Yeah. Are there other ways in which, you know, you find that your work, uh, in well-being now that we're focused back on the workplace, um, mm-hmm. has related even directly to your work and strategy. I know one we sort of started with at the top and we could maybe come back to now having lit up a bunch of different uh, things about, you know, is that 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 notion of like what it, how, what happens in the workplace as a strategist when you take a moment from away from looking forward and away from looking back and you're just, you know, here. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think it's um, especially important when you're kind of, I think, for me, you know, trying to come up with an a creative brief idea. Um, what are we going to do next quarter? What are we going to do for this campaign? And obviously, there's so much research that goes into those moments. And a lot of it is spent sitting at the laptop, really kind of like thinking and using the mind to think through things. But generally, that sort of aha moment or that true like idea or insight that is original will not come as you're sitting on the computer reading an article or typing out an outline. It is really more so when you step away. And I know people always kind of say like those thoughts that come to you in the shower. Um, but it's true in, in a lot of ways. It is when, when you're kind of letting the mind quiet down and not doing so much active researching and thinking. That's when all of that kind of starts to process somewhere behind that really um, powerful thinking mind that we have and kind of just allows it the creative um, aspect of the brain to come out. And that's what I've found. Um, one of the things that I often um, find as a creative and share with uh, um, other creatives that I'm working with is how much, kind of like uh, I'm asking it is given, how much uh, the universe is giving you on input what you need to create all the time. So I believe as I walk around in the world and move around in the world that uh I often am discovering colors and patterns and connections in nature and in man-made moments that uh, suddenly light up for me as inspiration for a creative solution for a client. Um, And the best way to be on input is to be still and in the moment. Uh, not trying to push something out, not trying to make noise, but uh, listening and being centered and still um, allows you to um, be on uh, receive, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, so to me, that's what you reminded me of is that um, taking these um, moments to focus on the body and the mind during the workday um, is actually also just opening you up as a receptor to, uh, to fuel a lot of great creative. Absolutely. It's not time, you know, not well spent for sure. It's, it's Mm -hmm. quite efficient in a way, like you were saying, it might kind of, you somehow are maybe operating even more efficiently when you take those mornings to hike and, and meditate. And it's interesting that you said like, you'll see colors and, um, patterns in nature. For me, it's numbers and, um, which makes sense because you're you're a creative and I'm you know an analyst strategist. But for me, it's like um, there's very distinct numbers that have always kind of popped up throughout my life. And when I feel the most in touch to um, myself, my own body, and you know really have have put in the time to practice either yoga or meditation, I'll kind of go out in the world and I'll see those numbers everywhere and license plates. Just it's just like very reassuring. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool. I think we we'll all we all discover it in different ways, but there are little signs that kind of confirm um, that you are sort of what they call vibrating on, you know, a higher level because, you know, you've put in that time. So I get it. Yeah. It's just different for me. I think it's different for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Which is cool. It's what makes us such an mm-hmm. interesting array of uh, of creations, you know, and humans. Hey, um, you know, I've taken the, the class, as you know, and, uh, and that is a great experience. But I was wondering, are there things that you also teach that are just things that I can do during my work day, you know, at my desk by myself that would help me to get into that vibrating space? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that we can do a couple of just, you know, simple chair stretches that don't even need, you don't even need to get up or on a mat or anything for us. So we'll, we'll do one or two of those. Um, but like, as I said earlier as well, definitely encourage you because you're home at least right now to, to drop down and, and, and do something that, you know, you might not be comfortable doing in front of a bunch of people in an office space. But like I said, too, I think one of the biggest things um, for anyone who works at a computer for most of their day is this tendency sort of for the shoulders to droop forward Mm -hmm. um, and sort of to find this like concave chest, right? Right, And you really kind of have to consciously roll the shoulders back and roll the shoulders down. So one of the best things to do to combat the, the shoulders rolling forward and this sort of hunching is to kind of, first of all, sit up straight kind of put both feet on the ground, start to find a balance between like the two sit bones. And then really just start to think about drawing the crown of the head. So this just the center part of your head, almost like it was being pulled up toward the sky, just finding a little bit more length in the spine as you sit tall. And then to open the chest, there's a couple of ways to do it. One of the simplest ways would just be to reach around and grab for opposite elbows behind your lower back. So very simply just grab, you know, right hand on left elbow, left hand on right elbow, and just notice how that starts to pull the Mm. shoulder blades apart and kind of create distance between the collarbones. And that's just one of the simplest things. Go ahead. (laughs) I was going to say at first, I also noticed that when I, I kind of uh, also um, forced myself into it, which I'm always reminding myself not to do, or like, oh, okay, I'm going to get, I'm going to get those wrists. But I also noticed that when I did that, I let my my shoulders creep up a little bit again. So I had to remind myself to sort of we're about opening, right? Yeah, that's one of the things I always try to remind in class too. There's also the tendency not only for them to drop forward, but also for with when there's tension for the shoulders to sort of creep up toward the ears is the best way to describe it. So kind of just consciously, if you think about those wings, like the shoulder blades on your back, which kind of look like wings, Um, If Mm -hmm. you visualize those really sliding down toward, in this case, the chair, or if you're standing down toward the earth, so kind of just pulling them down so that shoulders come away from the ears. And then I would encourage you, you know, kind of switch grips so that you get both sides, maybe switching hands and elbows so that there's not an unevenness there. But at its Mm -hmm. simplest, this is just a really nice way to, you know, create space here and bring the Mm -hmm. shoulders away from the ears. And then you kind of wanted that counter stretch. I saw you just Mm -hmm. kind of... (laughs) led into it so the other way uh the kind of the counter stretch to that would be to kind of tabletop the arms in front of you so the elbows are out in front and um the arms are kind of parallel to the ground and then just cross one over the other it doesn't matter which way so you're kind of crossing mm. elbows mm-hmm. and then either bring the, the hand other or if you can and not everyone can but you can kind of start to work the palms to touch so this is Ooh, an ego long, pose. So go. for you, Matt, I would, <laughs> yeah, I would just kind of directionally try to bring the palms toward the forearm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then from there, just start to pull the elbows forward, like toward your camera, in this case, your laptop. Mm-hmm. Um, and using that stretch on both directions, that eagle wrap, to kind of right. open up and create space in the back as well. Wow. So yeah, I'm really, those are two really of my tight favorite. There. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those are two of the good ones, two really easy, simple things that you can do um, during a meeting if you're not on video that you don't even need to get up for. So one other great way is to really just take a minute to come back to the breath. So again, just sitting really tall, grounding down into your chair through the sit bones, feet on the earth. And then I would invite you to bring either palms together at heart center. You can kind of touch uh, right between the breastbone with the thumbs. Or if that's not comfortable for you, you can always just place the palms on top of the thighs um, facing up. And just start to close your eyes. It's always great to take a moment to take out one of the senses, just starting to come within the body. And just without changing it, start to take notice of your breath. Just watch it. And see if you can seal the lips and just start to bring the inhales and exhales through your nose. So eyes are closed, mouth is sealed, just starting to breathe in and out through the nose. And take up just this body scan, especially the upper body, just kind of mentally noting that feeling of expansion as you breathe in, and then that feeling of letting it go. 
And see if you can start to deepen the breaths, maybe making them a little bit longer and controlling the exhales as well. And visually, even though the eyes are closed, just watch the breath going in and out through the nose. And then again, just like we did in that stretch, really think about drawing the crown of the head up toward the sky, creating length in the spine. Slide the shoulder blades down your back. And throughout the day, you can come to this for 30 seconds, a minute, and slightly start to flutter the eyelids open gently. Let the hands go. And just notice how the body feels. That was pretty quick. You can, of course, do it for longer. But even just that maybe 30 seconds that we just took there, I at least feel way more relaxed. We should have done that at the beginning, too. <laughs> I always am saying thank you at the end of an episode to a uh, guest, especially a great guest like you. But in this case, I want to say thank you because I feel so much better having stretched and breathed through the whole thing. So a big thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. 